tonight. If you guys would all stand, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, I thank you very much for this wonderful gathering. God, you are so great to us to allow us to be together in this place. We give you all the glory and all the praise. God, you are so wonderful in the way you care for us and see each of our needs. God, I ask that you keep your hand over the Harris family over this tragic loss. But Lord, we know that all things are held within your hand, that you see every mind, that you can heal every mind, Lord, that you provide peace and comfort. Perfect peace is found in your presence, Lord, so be with them. Lord, I ask that you be with Sister Shelby as she travels. Lord, keep her safe and alert. God, let your hand of protection be upon her, knowing that you go before and behind her, that you stand beside her as she goes. I ask for her work and all of our work in school, that you would allow it to be smooth, that you would allow us to have your perfect peace and confidence with us as we go throughout the regular aspects of the day, Lord, because you care about those things. Lord, we bring all things in prayer before you. And again, I thank you for the wonderful things all together here. And all the glory goes to you, Lord Jesus, and in your name I pray. Amen. Can we praise him a little bit in song?
our situations, every circumstance around us. God, my school and my workplace, my family, Lord, my relationships, God. There's liberty in these things, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Can we give him thanks for that tonight in our own 
some words with our hands lifted up, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for being who you are, God. You are so kind and caring to us. We thank you for keeping your hand on us every step of the way, God. Lord, let us not forget the things that you've already done for us, the deliverance that you've already brought, the freedom that you've already poured out on us, Lord. Let us not forget the peace that you've given us in our past, God. Lord, and even the peace that we hold on to right now, Jesus. As you continue to draw us closer to you, to move towards new levels with you, Lord. Let us not forget the goodness that you have done, God. Lord, I pray that you strengthen all of us tonight, Lord, in our souls, in our minds as we go through. Lord, it's so good to feel your presence here, but I pray that it doesn't just stay here, God. Yes. Lord, walk with your people, Jesus. You gave us a preparation of the gospel of peace, Lord, of knowing that you've ordered our steps, Lord. That's okay. Impact can be thank you for that, Lord. Your mighty Jesus. Lord, don't let us ever forget your goodness, God, how you're with us. But Lord, let what you've done for us in the past be motivation for our future, Lord. May you keep every promise that you make.
something in me has to I won't let the stones cry are glad to be at impact tonight praise god you can be seated is everyone having a good week good good missing a couple of people here tonight if you see someone if you don't see someone around here that is normally here send them a message be like hey where are you at i miss you tell them to come come back to impact will you guys do that for me someone you don't see Send them a message, however you do that. You know, I know you guys don't even really like text anymore. It's all like messenger and all of that. So whatever you normally do, do that. Praise God. I am very excited um, to continue our Revelation series, although I cannot tell you how blessed I was by Brother Kai's message last Wednesday night. Were you guys blessed by that as well? Um, what, what a wake-up call. Um, I saw a text or a, something on social media that related to your message this week, Brother Kai, and it said, whatever you're anxious about, that reveals what you're not trusting God about. And I was like, oh, I was like, conviction, you know, like, 
<sighs> if I'm worrying about it, then that means maybe I'm not trusting God about it. So uh, I, I love how Brother Kai put it. We're not the main character of this story. He is. He created it all. It all belongs to him. And we can trust him. And I'm so grateful. He uses used the, the uh, scripture from the book of Job. Where were you? And I, that's how I hear it in my head. Where were you? When I did all of this, when I created, where were you? You weren't there. So uh, praise God. Thank you, Brother Kai. Quick review. Chapter 5 is what we studied two weeks ago, and this was the throne room, right? The lamb is found worthy to, to open the scroll, right? Um, and there's worship of the lamb in heaven. Uh, there was a dilemma for a minute because they, they couldn't find anyone worthy to open the scroll. But then the lamb that was slain, Jesus Christ, he was, he takes the scroll and he opens it and worship then erupts. So going into lesson five, here's what's going to happen tonight. We're going to start opening the seals. Going to break the first six seals. Seals one through four, you're probably familiar with because we call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You've probably heard of that before. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into that. Then the fifth seal is the martyr's cry. And the sixth seal actually is going to bring out some information about the last judgment. And then I'm going to try to get through chapter seven, which talks about the redeemed army. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. So remember, the scroll is similar to a Roman will which could only be opened once the owner had died. So the owner of this scroll is Jesus Christ. He had died. So now we can open the scroll. But it's cool because normally the person that died doesn't get to open the scroll, but Jesus rose again. So he gets to open his own will, his own testament, and he's the one that gets to reveal it to us and to in execute the instructions. When my Mimi passed away, for whatever reason, she made the, me the executor of her estate. And that meant all the documents that she wrote, I had to go around and tell everyone, this is what Mimi said we have to do. And it wasn't super fun to do that to my uncles that are much older than me, <laughs> um, and to my dad, but um, that's, that was my job. And so that's what Jesus is doing. He's opening his will, he's reading it, and he's saying, here's what has to be done. He executes the instructions. All right, so starting in chapter 6, it opens with a description of four horsemen, often called the horsemen of the apocalypse. Have you guys ever heard of these guys? Okay, I think they're all kind of scary. The opening of the seal coincides with Jesus taking his place on the throne. The events described begin taking place immediately. Okay, and they continue, they will continue until his return. Remember, Revelation is not a roadmap or a sequential play-by-play -play of the end of history, right? I'm not going to talk about Joe Biden tonight. John is concerned with the nature and the meaning of these images, okay? Conveying an understanding of the judgments that are coming on the earth and reminding us of who is truly on the throne. Who's truly on the throne? Jesus is it. Amen. So they, um, the, these horsemen had already arrived. Had the, these judgments had already, already begun to be poured out when John wrote his apocalypse. Because as soon as Jesus ascended into heaven and he took his place on the throne, he opened his will. And he began. To, so we're not waiting on the four horsemen. This isn't something that's going to happen in the future. It's actually been going on throughout the church age present today and throughout until Jesus comes back. These four horsemen are described in Zechariah's prophecy approximately 500 years before Jesus walked the earth. Let's read that prophecy. Zechariah chapter 6 verse number 1 says, Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains uh, were mountains of bronze. And we're not going to get into all of Zechariah's stuff tonight. we got to focus on John's stuff, okay? With the first chariot were red horses. With the second chariot were black horses. With the third chariot were white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. These chariots were commissioned, if you keep reading in Zechariah chapter 6, to, by God to patrol the earth and to punish the nations who had oppressed his people. So it's judgment, right? It's the judgment of God being poured out. So let's read about the first one that John sees. 
Revelation 6, verse number 1. Now I saw the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, Come and see. Again, this very open policy of heaven, right? God wants us to know what's going on. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, at first glance, perhaps this is the great conqueror. This is Jesus coming down. Does anyone see why that you might think that? The white horse, the, the crown on his head. But this description is intentionally deceptive. If we look a little more closely, we will see that this is an imposter, that this is a deceiver, that he's intentionally posing as a conqueror. In the end times, false prophets will be so powerful that they will mislead the world and perhaps even mislead the church. In fact, when Jesus describes the end times, he warns in every one of the synoptic gospels, what are the synoptic gospels? What does that mean? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called that because they kind of, they overlap the most, right? They're in sync. They're synoptic. John, he's like, I'm going to do my own thing, right? Okay, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic gospels. The accounts, uh, each one warn us of watching for this deceiver. Mark chapter 13, Jesus answered and began to say, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. That's in Mark 13, Matthew chapter 25. Jesus answered and said, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Luke chapter 21, and he said, take heed that you not be deceived, for many will come in my name saying, I am he and the time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. So this first horseman is a deceiver. The rider represents a satanic force attempting to defeat and oppress believers spiritually, either by deception or by persecution. We see this in the world today, don't we? Another clue. It says he went out conquering and to conquer. What is the object of conquering? To win the war, right? However, we already read in chapter 5 that the Lamb has already taken the scroll and is declared the winner. He does not need to go forth conquering and to conquer when he has already won. So another clue that this is an imposter. Um, the Greek uh, of that term went out to conquering and to conquer. Nikon ke ina nikese. Do you guys... Um, we get a, a modern brand from this verb, which is... Nike, which means victory. You guys didn't know that. <laughs> so you have to throw your Nikes away. No, I'm just kidding. No, Nike is the Greek word for victory. And so it's very, it's a good, it's a good athlete name, right? It's a good sports name. You want to be victorious, right? But Jesus is already victorious. He doesn't have to go and conquer and, and try to conquer more. He is already one. Amen? One more clue. You guys ready? What weapon is in his hand? A bow. Jesus is never described as carrying a bow as a weapon. In fact, an evil kingdom that will arise in the end called Gog, which is probably maybe like people in the Russian area, uh, described in Ezekiel 30, is described as carrying a bow. Jesus' weapon is always a sword. Revelation chapter 1, in his mouth, out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, he who has the sharp two-edged sword, and I forgot to highlight the one, but it's a, there's another one right there. And in chapter 19, verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Jesus doesn't carry a bow. Jesus carries a sword, or it's going out of his mouth. And we know that that is representative of what? The word. Yeah. The word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder even to the bone. And Right? Yeah. To the intents of the heart. <sighs> okay. All right, so horseman number one is the deceiver, deception sent to confuse us and to lie to us. Horseman number two, we read about in verse number three. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. 
Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Now, I want to show you a few things. Jesus already has a sword. Jesus was already the conqueror, but in these verses, the, the word that it he was granted to the one who sat on to take peace, he was given a sword. This verb, edothe, means he was given permission. He didn't have it on his own. He was given permission by God. He was given a weapon to go and to do this. It's, and it's in a passive voice. So it's not the person, it's not the writer that has these things. Someone gave them to him. Now, we understand that this is divine permission from God. Not that it's God's will. And we talked about this maybe a couple weeks ago. Does evil exist? Evil is the absence of good, right? It's just the same as does darkness exist? No, darkness is the absence of light. Does cold exist? No, cold is the absence of heat. So God is not imposing evil on the world. He's just allowing it. He's just pulling his spirit back and saying, you can go and show your true colors and do your thing because people have to have a choice. Do you know what's amazing? And we're going to get to this eventually. <laughs> Even after the rapture, and there's all the crazy stuff that's going to go down and the Antichrist and the mark of the beast, and we're going to get to all that. We're not, not tonight. God still gives people one more chance. Even after all that. The church is already gone. And he's like, I'm going to give you one more chance. He just keeps, talk about a merciful God. Talk about a loving God. Now, I don't know how many are going to make it through all of that. I certainly don't want to be here to try it. But there, <laughs> but it's not impossible. I don't know if you guys ever, I've never watched any of them, but there's like a whole like left behind series. It sounds scary. I've never, have you watched it? Is it super scary? Yeah. Okay. Intense. You guys can have it. I don't want it. Okay. So the writer this writer seeks to take peace from the earth by stirring up strife and warfare among the world's nations. Now, again, this has been happening since, since Jesus ascended. And I think sometimes we as Americans, we don't really realize the amount of war that's going on in the world because we're untouched by it. Let me just tell you a little bit about what is currently going on in the world. There are currently four major wars going on in the world. And what is classified as a major war is 10,000 or more people a year die in these wars. In Myanmar, which started in 1948, there have been 9,800 casualties just this year and somewhere between 180 and 200,000 total people that have died in that war. That war is going on right now. Right now, the Russo, uh, Russia, Russian Ukrainian war which started in, did you guys know this actually started in 2014? We thought it just started a few years ago. It's been going on for almost 10 years. There have been an estimated, now these are big numbers because we don't, between 16 and 95,000 casualties this year. And that a total of over a million people, no, excuse me, a total of over 200,000 people have died in the Ukrainian war. It's happening right now. Right now, the Ethiopian civil conflict, which started in 2018, between 177 and 600,000 people dead in that war. The Sudan conflict started in 2023, and just this year already 11,000 people dead. Those are the four major wars that are happening in the world right now. We don't really think about that because that's not happening to us. There are also, besides the four major wars going on, there are currently 16 what are just classified as wars, which means less than 10,000 people die a year. And in those wars, since the beginning of whenever they started till now, over 5.5 million deaths in the current wars that are happening. Minor conflicts, 100 to 999 dead. 21 conflicts with over 5,000 dead this year. Skirmishes and clashes, which means fewer than 100 people dead. 15 different ones throughout the world with over 400 dead this year. That's all happening in the world today. 
One of those in the current wars that's less than 10,000 dead is the Mexican drug war that's happening right now. That's happening in our nation because those people are coming into our nation from the nation of Mexico. So we see the second seal, the second rider. He does everything he can to stir up war in the world. The third rider, the third seal. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it, a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. And basically what this is saying, this is affecting economics. Scales equals famine. In the ancient world, a pair of scales stood for a time of famine. As in such times, food was rationed out by scales. Let me, just get, let me just bring it home for you for a second. In the United States, right now, inflation is at 8.6%. Let me tell you what that means. That means everything you buy is 9% more expensive than it was last year. And have you had to put fuel in your cars lately? <laughs> it's expensive. It is the highest that it has been since the year that I was born, 1981, inflation. And again, I'm not trying to predict modern day events, but we see this third rider at work right now in our economy, right now in the world economy. But I also want you to remember that he can't do anything that the Lord doesn't allow him to do. None of these riders can do anything that the Lord has not allowed. And then finally, when I... He opened the fourth seal. I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed with him and power was given to him, them over a fourth of the, of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death and by the beasts of the earth. Now remember, the power was given to him to do those things. Death and Hades are satanic forces under the ultimate governance of the throne of God. Brother Kai last week talked about Job. Satan wasn't allowed to do anything to Job that God didn't first say was okay. And in fact, Satan even went back once and was like, well, he's not going to give up because you won't let me touch his body. He'd already killed his whole family. He'd already killed all of his livestock. He'd already set a tornado to blow all of his stuff down. Some of us know how that feels. And then God said, okay, touch his body. And Satan comes down and his body is covered in boils. You guys didn't have to have chicken pox when you were little because you had vaccines. I had chicken pox. <laughs> the old people in the back row had chicken pox. I had chicken pox in my ears. I had chicken pox on my toes. You couldn't lay on your back because you itched so bad from the chicken pox. And that was just chicken pox. He had scale, he had s s sores and boils all over his body. You can't, can't find a comfortable position. Death in Hades. Remember who actually has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. That's Jesus Christ, right? So he is allowing this writer, he is allowing death to come in, and, and this word death right here probably refers to pestilence or disease. We went through a global epidemic just a couple of years ago. Pestilence, disease. They're trying to say that we're going to go back into it, which I rebuke that in Jesus' name. But remember, he was given permission, and he was only given permission to kill one-fourth of the earth. Just wait, later they'll get more permission, okay? So, these judgments are on the earth. They're not independent, right? They, they work together, they're all parallel as parts of the overall judgment. And the church is here for all of these. Because we're in it right now, guys. The four horsemen, they're here, okay? So you don't have to be scared of them. You've already made it through a bunch of it, okay? Just keep on keeping on, right? The chariots we read about in Zechariah, did you have a comment? Is that where you're? Go ahead. Just 
described it not as the, the absence of food, but the inability to obtain food, mm -hmm. which kind of like came to my mind when recent times we've dealt with supply chain issues just in this country. Yeah. And I get fussy about not being able to find a couple of people things, but how quickly it can change to where there's things there, but there's no way to get access to them. You guys remember going to the store and you couldn't find pasta? Remember that? You remember going, you couldn't find toilet paper? Stuff like that. So that is what he's referring to. It might not even be that it's not there, it's that we can't get to it. Good. So you see how they're all overlapping? Pestilence and famine working together. The chariots that we read about in Zechariah pro prophetically foreshadowed John's vision of these horsemen, and they are clearly grouped together as one. The faithful, uh, there's, a, there's two different purposes to these, right? The faithful are going to be purified by these things. What did what is what does the, the epistle say? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials, for it's the purifying of your faith, right? But those who compromise into idolatry and are disloyal to Jesus are going to be judged. Just think about the two thieves that hung on either side of Jesus' cross. In that moment of suffering, one of them converted to being a believer while the other one used their suffering and their heart was hardened towards God. Same suffering, same situation, two very different responses to suffering. There is and will be great conflict in the earth because we are in the life and death conflict between the enemy and the church. That's where we are right now. And we win by persevering and being a faithful witness. We were given the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. We like to shout about the power of the Holy Ghost, but you want to know why you have the power of the Holy Ghost? It's so you can make it through these things, and you can be a witness. People are going to look at you in these times when the horsemen are trotting through your life, and they're going to say, how do you have such a good outlook? How do you have so much faith? How are you able to keep going? You want to know why? Because you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, and it's not your own strength. It's the power of the Spirit that's taking you through it. We win by persevering and being a faithful witness. We were given the power of the Holy Ghost to be witnesses of God throughout the earth. In fact, we see throughout history and revelation that the judgments are often ineffective in bringing people to repentance. It is the church's power as a suffering witness that will convince the world of the truth. Not the persecution you, the way you make it through, that's what is going to convince them. So it makes sense that John wrote to the seven churches of Asia Minor and encouraged, and encouraged them to persevere in the face of suffering. Remember? Don't give up. He that endures to the end. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. This has already begun at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. Now, we see another foreshadowing of these first four seals in another prophetic book in the Old Testament. You guys remember the, the big word that I taught you about to understand the New Testament? We have to study the Old Testament. Intertextuality. Good. So we got to look back. Daniel chapter 7, it describes these four winds of heaven, four beasts arising. So let's look at this really quick. It's going to be important here in a minute. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head, visions of his head while on his bed. That's a weird way to say it. Then he wrote down the dream. Telling the main facts, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. These great beasts, which are four, by the way, if you didn't know, there's four, um, are four kings which arise out of the earth. So more to come on this soon, but I wanted to, uh, since we were talking so much about the number four, I wanted to throw that in there. Okay. Let's look at the fifth seal. You guys ready? The first four are the four horsemen, right? Seal number five starts in verse number nine. When he, I like these old paintings of how they depict like Bible stuff because it's usually hilarious. Kind of interesting. Okay, so this is the altar in heaven. This is the earth, right? There's like fire coming down, scary. 
And in heaven, they're giving them white robes. So kind of naked people there, but it's really blurry. Okay, verse number nine. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. We call these martyrs, right? And I, they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. This is the fifth seal, okay? The fifth seal is the response of slain and glorified saints to all of this suffering that's been going on, the four horsemen, okay? All genuine believers, guess what? We will experience suffering of one sort or another as part of our faithfulness to God. I hope and pray that none of us have to suffer to the point of death, but we will all suffer in some way. Usually it's some form of persecution or uh, fam family tra trauma, right? Um, Mark chapter 8 tells us that whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake shall save it. This is who we're talking about. Under the altar... This is the heavenly altar. It's not the sacrificial altar where they like kill the animals, right? It's the, it's the presence of the throne of God like the altar of incense in the tabernacle, right? Where the prayers were offered. And under emphasizes this divine protection which has held sway over their souls despite their suffering. Now, I, I've, for some reason I decided to teach you guys a bunch of Greek tonight, okay? So they, crowd with a, they cried with a loud voice. What this says, listen, phone megale, phone megale, which is actually like megaphone, right? They cried with a loud voice as if they were holding a megaphone. They were crying to God so loudly. This shows the question. I feel like this gives us some permission. Have you ever had to ask God why? Even the saints that have been martyred, they sit under the altar and they say, God, why? How much longer? God, how much longer are you going to allow this to go on? And you know, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but it's because of their loud cry that God's going to respond here in a second. It's because of it. Do you know that your cries out to God, your prayers to God, your times where you're like, God, how much longer? It affects God's actions. It causes him to move. Verse number 11, then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, were completed. It's not to say that there's like an exact number, but it's just to say the suffering isn't over yet. Hold on just a minute. But I feel like God's saying like, hold my coffee, I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going to go take care of stuff, right? And uh, he's like, just, just give me a few minutes. They were given white robes, which indicated their purity and their vindication. The vast majority of theologians argue, and you'll see this next week when we start the lesson, that the trumpet sequence that's coming, right? Because we've got the, the seals and then the trumpets and then the vials or bowls, right? That the trumpets is the answer to the victim's complaint of how long. And there's seven of them. And they're even more ferocious than the seals. Okay, so that is the fifth seal. Does anyone have any questions so far? I'm like ramrodding. Go. They're demonic forces. They're demonic forces but they can only do what God allows them to do. Um, yeah, so I don't think you could say, like, the white horseman is here in this building right now. Like, it's just kind of like something that's happening on the earth that he represents. That they're oh Roman gods no uh -uh. they're not individual they they encompass a, an entire uh, form of judgment yes yes good question so we the fifth seal or the martyrs megaphone right crying loudly how long God then the sixth seal 
I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll, and when it is rolled up in every mountain, as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? We fast forwarded here a little bit. Because remember how the seals and the trumpets and the bowls circle back on each other? So the sixth seal, although we are still in the church age up to seal five, I believe that seal six jumps forward to the end. And this is describing the final judgment. There's a big gap between seals five and six, okay? I know we've definitely seen the first four open. Perhaps we have five. I don't know. But six, we haven't. That doesn't mean, uh, because of this jump, that there's not a lot that's going to happen between these two, the crying out of the martyrs and the final judgment. In fact, we know that there's a lot more that's going to happen because we still have to explore all the trumpets and all the vials, right? Some of those maybe have happened, but certainly all of them have not happened. But this fits here. Why did John put this right here? Why did God show him this here with the sixth seal? But I think it's because it's the explicit and the final answer to the saint's plea. He's like, you guys are asking me why and how long? Let me just hit fast forward and show you the end real quick. Show you what's really going to go down. There's going to be a great earthquake and there's going to be darkness and the sky is going to roll up like a scroll and the great men and the wicked men of the earth are going to cry out to the mountains, fall on us and cover us because we can't stand the wrath of the great and mighty God. That's going to be the vengeance and the vindication of God. It will be a final judgment and it looks like this. There are six parts of the cosmos that are mentioned. The earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and then every mountain and island. An island is a mountain, right? It's just a mountain in the water versus on the land, right? So six parts of the cosmos. Then he mentioned six different classes of humanity that are going to be affected by this. Rulers and kings, great ones, commanders, rich, mighty, and then every slave and every free man. What does the number six represent? Who was created on the sixth day? Humanity. The number six represents fallen humanity. So it's no wonder that he put the final judgment as the sixth seal, and there were six parts of the cosmos. Do you see all the symbolism that John puts in? All six parts of the cosmos that are destroyed and six parts of hum classes of humanity that are included. But here's the good news, guys. As Christians, this world is not our home. We're not bound to just stay here forever. But, for lack of a better term, earth dwellers, unbelievers, they are at home here with material wealth, with injustice, with false religion, moral pollution, some or all of which they have made their gods. So the unbeliever's refuge on earth has to be removed. Creation itself, the sun, the moon, the stars, trees, animals, have become idols which must be removed in the final judgment. Those are the first six seals. Does that help a little bit? Questions or comments about that? Yeah, yeah. I told Chris as I was, he got home from work and I was like, I can't wait to teach this tonight. I've learned so much just from studying it. And yet, I don't know about you, the more we study, it's like the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> and the more I have to learn, the more I have to study. Okay, can we do chapter seven real quick? You guys get going, doing okay? Are you okay? <laughs> Yeah, 
We'll get sacks for you to breathe in. Okay, before getting to the seventh seal, there's kind of this parentheses of sorts, which is chapter seven, and it explains how God is gonna, this is a good part, you ready? How he's gonna keep believers safe during these times of tribulation in the church age. This is what verse chapter seven is about. Believers will not be harmed spiritually, but not spiritually. When they go through the four seals of the horsemen, John sees four standing. Remember, he sees four angels, or you're, we're going to read right here. He sees four angels, which we've talked about many times, the number four. Let's keep going. Revelation chapter 7, verse number 1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Okay? So it's important to know. We've got four angels. They're holding back these winds on the four corners of the earth. I know it's like it's not four corners in that picture, but those are kind of cool looking angels. Do not Google like Revelation chapter six. I mean, you'll see a lot of crazy pictures. I mean, you can. It's stuff like this. It's stuff like this. Okay. So four angels on four corners of the earth. Four represents completion, right? The, the wholeness, the fullness of the earth, right? What, what does our compass look like? North, south, east, and west, right? Four corners. What? Four corners of the earth. They have sovereignty over the whole earth. Now, I'm going to argue to you that the four winds of the earth that they're holding back are the four horsemen. Okay, you ready? The four, the four winds are the four horsemen, which you can read about in Zechariah chapter 6 and in Daniel chapter 7 that we read earlier. This is a prophecy about the angels literally holding back the evil forces of destruction from the earth. But the delay is only temporary until something is accomplished. You ready to see what they accomplish in the delay? This is cool. Verse number 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. I'm going to tell you. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. I know. I know. There's going to be a seal put on the foreheads of the servants of God. Ezekiel chapter 9, talking about intertextuality, Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord commands an angel to put a mark on the foreheads of those who hate sin before he strikes judgment. You guys remember in the book of Exodus that the, that the children of Israel were to put a mark on their house so that the death angel would pass over. This is a very common concept that God uses, that somehow he's going to mark his people Somehow he's going to designate his people away from all the others, and they are going to be saved from the destruction that is coming. This mark protects them from spiritual and even at times physical judgment. The demonic powers are forbidden to harm those with the seal. Remember, servants here really is, it's the word doulos. It means bond servant. It means slave, right? The seal... It's the seal that enables God, God's people to respond to faith. So I know, pastor screaming in there. I don't know. So here's a few things that the seal does. It gives us protection. It can mean to be an authenticator. So you are an authentic, you know, this is genuine Looney Tunes leather, right? You are authentic <laughs> Christian when you have the seal of God. It can designate ownership, it was a common practice in the ancient world to mark slaves on the forehead to indicate ownership. Who are we? We are servants. We are bond servants. We are slaves of Christ. And we will have a mark. Now, I also want to argue to you that the seal that is given to us is the divine name. There's also reason to believe that this seal references the, di the divine name being applied to our lives. We know that through baptism, we put on the name of Christ because uh, we also see another mark in the book of Revelation that you guys have all heard of before. 
being put on unbelievers to signify the name of their protector. Let me show you, Revelation chapter 3, that no one may buy or sell except the one with the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation chapter 14, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image, he receives his mark on his forehead, forehead or on his hand. But there's one more component of the seal of God, and I believe that that is the Spirit of God. In several places, Paul reminds us of the seal of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Ephesians chapter 1, in him who also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you just thought that being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost was your ticket to heaven. In fact, it is the seal on your forehead that marks you as his, you are authentic, a prized possession of Jesus when you have the seal on your life. There's a video and yeah, I can send notes. This is what will take you through the trials and tribulations of life, which will in turn be the saving witness that will turn the nations to Christ. It's all about having the name of Jesus and having the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the seal. Praise God. Okay, one one more. You guys ready? Okay. <laughs> I know. I told you. There's great stuff. Verse number four. Verse number four. Verse number four. Don't write all this down. And I heard the number of those, I'll send you these slides and my notes and everything. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel was sealed. And then it shows you all the tribes and each of them had 12,000. This is a very, there is a very confusing doctrine floating around that only 144,000 people are going to be in heaven. <laughs> we are reading the book of Revelation way too literally if we think this is true. Of the trillions of people that lived on the earth, surely the Lord is going to save more than 144,000. So why the list? If you read forward to verse number nine, if you read forward to verse number nine, it speaks of an innumerable number of the nations in heaven. So there's clue number one. These depictions of heaven are the same reality. Verses four through eight are a census of the tribes of Israel. And why did Israel take a census? Let's look. Numbers chapter one, verse number two. Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their families, by their father's houses, according to the number of names, every male individually from 20 years old and above, and who are able to go to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number them by their armies. The 144,000 are an army. This is the purpose of the census as Israel took a census to number their army. So why give a specific number? Let's look at the description of New Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. All right. I know, I'm jumping all over the place, but it's good stuff, right? Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west. And now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles. What are they talking about right here? This is the new Jerusalem. Come down. Because heaven and earth is going to pass away. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth, and Jerusalem co will come down. And the walls are named after the 12 tribes, or the gates are, is it the gates or the walls? Gates are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. And the 12 foundations are named after the 12 apostles. Together, they form the foundational, the, the, the foundation and the walls of the structure of new Jerusalem. So little maths here, you guys ready? 12 times 12 is 144. This represents the entire people of God through the ages, the Old Testament, 
and the New Testament, the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel, 144. When you multiply it by a thousand, it just reinforces that notion of completion of everyone that will be there. One final point, and then I'm going to let you guys be free. Hymns, as in songs, right? Hymns in heaven typically summarize the themes of the preceding sections. So we see at the close of chapter 7, praise around the throne after the final judgment. These are the hymns. And crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to foundations of, to fountains of living waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There is judgment on the earth. There is darkness on the earth. But this is what we have to look forward to. Those that are sealed by the mark of God, we're going to be singing this hymn in heaven together. Every tear wiped away. Never to hunger again. Never to thirst again. Never to grieve again. This is what we have to look forward to. Next week, we will study chapters 8 and 9. We're going to break the seventh seal, silence in heaven. And then we're going to study the four trumpets. You'll see a great overlap between the trumpets and the seals that we just studied. Chapter 9, we'll finish out the fifth and the sixth trumpets. And that's how far we're going to try to get next week. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Questions, comments? For the Kai. So I would ask him what scripture he's basing that upon, because that has to be based. We can't have an opinion that's not based on scripture. Um, there are other scriptures, and, and help me out, Bible scholars, with this. There are other scriptures um, in the Old Testament, and I'll find them for you, and I'll send them to you, that talk about the fullness of wickedness. And what the Lord is saying is there are nations and, and enemies of Israel that he has to allow for a certain, and for the church, he has to allow for a certain time, like the horsemen, like the others that we're seeing, he has to allow them for a certain time because he has to leave that door open. Or he chooses to leave that door open as long as he possibly can. But I don't find in scripture where it says there's an exact number. So the door staying open is God's mercy, right? He is keeping, he is allowing evil to continue on the earth because as long as there's evil, then people can still make a choice for good. People can still come to God. So he leaves that door open. However, there's another verse that says, if the Lord tarries too long, even the very elect, that's us, won't make it. So he has to balance I got to have mercy, but I can't wait too long because then everything, I mean, these people have messed stuff up so much that if I wait too long, everything's going to self-destruct. So I'm going to leave it open as long as I can 
to give people as much opportunity as I possibly can. But then I have to close the door at some point because evil will, the scripture says that mine's, that man's heart is on evil continually. So I would ask your friend to point to the scriptures that, that give them that theory. And then we can have a more specific conversation, but God, keeping the door, God keeping the door open is his mercy. But the saints of the, the voices of the martyrs cry loud, how long God? And that motivates him to shut the door. The final judgment will come. Does that help at all? Anyone else? Thank you guys for your attention. I am thoroughly enjoying getting to study this with you. So whoever suggested, or the group of you that, that suggested, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think we're going to close in prayer. I, I know that we've done a lot of study, but, but Bible study doesn't have to be unspiritual. In fact, I feel like the more knowledge that the Lord entrusts to us, the more is required of us. And we now understand more clearly why we've been given the Holy Ghost, why we have been baptized in Jesus' name. It's not just a get out of hell free ticket. It is to empower us to be witnesses. It is to empower us to, uh, to help others that are going through all the challenges of life that you're going through. They just don't have God. That should... that. I heard a song once that said, Lord, break my heart with the things that break your heart. That should break our hearts, the lost. And so I want us to focus our prayers on that tonight about, Lord, we, we, we hear clearly what your word is saying. And so help me, uh, help me to become more serious about reaching the lost, about reaching my community, because the time is, is, is drawing close truly is. You can feel it, can't you? The craziness of this world. So let's pray together and just ask the Lord to help us, to give us boldness, and to, to give us a conviction for this. Lord, we, we're grateful for your word tonight, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for calling us and choosing us, but help us to remember why you did that. Yes, you love us, and, and we thank you for saving us. But help us to remember the purpose behind all of it, God, which is to see your kingdom come. God, put a conviction in our hearts like we've never had before to be witnesses. God, put a conviction in our hearts like we never have had before, God, to share the hope of the gospel, God, to share the truth of the gospel, Lord. There's a world that is dying and suffering, God, that doesn't know you, and we have the answer. Help us, Lord, to, to walk in boldness and to trust in you, to use the spirit that you've given us, God. Lord, to be witnesses to all the earth. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen.